Well, we have been spending the last few weeks hitting the highlight reel of uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew. The Sermon on the Mount is the longest teaching discourse from Jesus in all of the Gospels. And um, I hope you'll read along with me this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And you can get your Bibles or your Bible apps or the Pew Bibles to read it along with me in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 21, but before I read, just a word of warning, everybody, you better buckle up because I don't care who you are or how holy you may be, this is hard stuff to hear. So I invite you to read with me. We're going to be hearing about anger and grudges and resentments. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, You fool, you'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar... If you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. And truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. I warned you, didn't I? Here in verse 21 of chapter 5, Jesus begins by lifting up Jewish law, thou shalt not kill. And then he sets the bar even higher for people who follow him. It's like Jesus is saying, you know, you can check the box. You can even show up and go to church on Sunday and drop money in the offering plate. But what's in your heart? It's how you live that matters. Faith is a journey. For Jesus, it isn't enough to just say, I show up. It isn't enough to just say, uh, I do not kill anyone. One of the big ten commandments. Jesus says it's what's in our heart that matters as well. Beginning in verse 21, Jesus names the Jewish law. Then he sets a new, even higher expectation. You've heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder. Whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you'll be liable to judgment. And then he goes on to say, when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, then leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. Now, one New Testament professor suggests this is a great example of Jesus using hyperbole here with exaggerated speech to make and prove his point. Like when he says, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it away. I've never met anyone who's taken that one literally. Or the time Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye and then you'll better be able to see the splinter in your neighbor's eye. He loved to use colorful language that helps to make a dramatic point. Jesus says, if you're at the altar and you remember your brother or sister or something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. Another one, he says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him. Or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and then you'll be thrown in prison and never get out. So I asked myself this week, what are the, what's the point of both of these examples? This hyperbole speech that he offers, what is he trying to actually get us to understand? If you remember someone has a problem with you while you're at the altar, he says, go immediately and try to make it right with them first. He mentioned another example. He's cutting, he's cutting into attorney's business here. Confront your accuser while you're on the way to the judge. What's the point? So I thought about this. And are you ready for my best 
Masters of Divinity from Vanderbilt University Biblical Exegesis. Are you ready for it? Here's what I think it is. Deal with it. That's what I believe he's trying to get us to understand. Deal with it. Deal with your anger. Deal with your hurt and your resentment. Deal with your conflicts because when you don't, it just gets bigger, harder, heavier to carry. You end up in prison for the rest of your life, as Jesus says. Deal with it before the judge has to wade in, before you go to the altar. Deal with it. It just gets bigger, doesn't it? It just gets messier when we don't. One thing I want you to notice here is that he doesn't actually say, don't you ever get angry. He doesn't say, if you are holy enough or live your right life the right way, then you will never get angry and you will never be angry at anyone else and they will never be angry at you. But Jesus seems to assume that anger really is a part of the human experience. In fact, we know that Jesus himself got angry. One of the last things he did before his arrest in Jerusalem was when he shut down business as usual at the temple by tossing over those tables. That was pretty angry, Jesus. Jesus got angry. In fact, anger helps us to know that something is not as it should be. It helps us to know of injustices and wrongs. Paul in Ephesians, he puts it this way, be angry but do not sin. He says, do not let the anger, the sun go down on your anger. There it is again, this message to deal with it, to face it. Anger has its place in our world, but the truth is we can't live there forever. I remember babysitting my little cousin as a team, and her mom had given us instructions to make sure that she had cleaned up her absolute bomb of a bedroom before she got home. And so I set my cousin to work, and I went down in front of the TV probably. And um, a little while later, she came out, and she said, I've got a doll cleaned up. Come check it out, Kara. And I thought, wow, that was really fast. And I looked at the room, and it was so tidy, but it was also a little bare. And I noticed she was standing in front of the closet door, And I had her move out of the way and opened it up, and it all literally came spilling out around my feet. She just wanted to shove it in there and hide it away and not deal with it. Pretend it's not there, not face it. And yet, when we don't, it just gets bigger. In fact, sometimes it even spills out onto innocent bystanders. If you've ever had a really hard day at work and you suddenly notice that you're yelling at your dog a little bit louder. We can take it out on the wrong people. My favorite, Frederick Buechner, he has a wonderful reflection about anger. In fact, I've probably read it to you all before. He says, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, To roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come. To savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it's a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself and the skeleton at the feast is you. This is a really small example from my own life, but a few weeks ago when I went to this minister's conference, I had landed back in Nashville on Southwest, and I was doing what we all do. We take our turns aisle by aisle, row by row, and you get up and you get your heavy overhead compartment bin out and you bring it down. And I was doing that when I, as I swung my bag down, I noticed I came close to hitting somebody behind me in a row behind me. And I, when I did that, I said, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you there. And she rolled her eyes and said, oh, yes, you did. <laughs> now, I apologized the second time because I'm a good Kentucky woman, but I did not mean it that time. <laughs> and I tell you... 
I stewed about that all the way back to Western Kentucky. <laughs> and that's small. I mean, who hasn't lost their mind getting off an airplane a time or two? That's small potatoes. I recognize when I talk about this today that this is hard stuff. It's hard, especially when we have been hurt or wounded deeply. Maybe even harder sometimes when we have been hurt or wounded deeply, if someone has hurt someone we love. It's so hard to deal with. And here is what Jesus is asking us to do, to face it, to deal with it, and to try to do that sooner rather than later, to make it right, to learn the gift it is to actually say, I am sorry. And the gift it is sometimes just to hear it. And this, at this moment, I want to offer a little disclaimer here because um, I do recognize that this is such a hard topic. And um, sometimes relationships can't go back to what they once were. Not every relationship probably should go back to what it once was. And I think sometimes... Well-intentioned ministers like myself, we have been quick to push those who have experienced great suffering and abuse straight on the path of forgiveness and reconciliation. And sadly, unintentionally, we have hurt the very people in need of compassion and mercy. Jesus is first and foremost a savior of compassion and mercy. That's how this whole sermon begins, with blessings, with the Beatitudes. Jesus is a Savior of compassion and mercy, and I hope you hear me when I say that today. I remember years ago, I still have this somewhere, I got a random letter in the mail from someone out of state, and when I opened the letter, um, it was a woman writing to me who said she had grown up in our town, and when she was a kid, she had stolen some candy and a comb from the department store down the street from our church. And she had looked up on the internet, and that department store was long gone, and so she thought the closest place to make it right was our church, and so she put $10 cash in the letter and offered her apology for that mistake so many years ago. And I really admire her for doing that, frankly. I, golly, there's, she'd carried that for almost 50 years. <laughs> almost 50 years she had carried the regret and shame of something she had done as a child. It is never too late to try and make things right. And I really admire her for doing that. But I also recognize that here is Jesus in this message today telling us to not wait 50 years, to try to face it sooner, to let go of that shame and that regret or that mistake so long ago so that we can be free. When we try to move past our anger and our hurts and our resentment, the person we are really setting free is our own selves. To drop the weight of resentment and anger that is weighing us down, wrecking our sleep, stealing our joy. Because the skeleton at the feast really and truly is us. And so I just invite you to take a moment this morning to ask yourself what role anger or resentment might be playing in your life right now. Does it consume you more than you would like to admit? Is it time for you to deal with it? When I was writing this message, I thought, well, I'm going to end today with a few action steps for all of us to consider, but I've actually decided to skip the advice today and go straight to prayer and so I'm going to close this time together with a prayer. And it's actually not my own. It's from a theologian and author I really admire. Her name's Kate Bowler. And she wrote this prayer. And she calls this a prayer for when you need love to conquer hate. So I invite you to close with me now in prayer. 
God, I'm stuck in a cycle of emotion that feels a lot like hatred, though I can hardly admit it. God of love, help me to breathe here, get my bearings, and find my way back to you. God, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Spirit, have mercy. We put aside the easy burden, which is self-accusation, and weigh ourselves down with the heavy one, self-justification. Blessed are we who come to you, God, with hurt and anger in our hearts. Bring it all to you before it escapes our lips as invective or gets buried and stored up in us as bitterness. Blessed are we who say, God, we can sit down together and sort this through. Help me to get to the bottom of it, to the whole truth. What do I need to know about this? Show me what I must resist or refute or admit that I might remain straight and true inside to live in the integrity of a faith that says, love our enemies. God, this is hard because in facing our anger and rejection, it's come toward me, a shadow appears, and it's my own profile. God, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Spirit, have mercy. Peace is forgiveness received and shared as love. And through love, all pain will turn to medicine. Amen.